outro cast. Mark, thank you for doing this. The last time I had the pleasure of speaking with you, the Feel Flows box set was the new thing. And you've worked on dozens of things since then. But how's your day going aside from having to talk to this guy? <laughs> it's, it's 10 in the morning here. So, so uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just caffeinated and getting ready to get going. Well, that's actually something I'm very, very curious about. I'm a nocturnal person as well. I use the energy drinks to perk up. Are you a traditional coffee person? Yeah, I used to be. Well, I was into the when I was moving around, you know, going out more, uh, doing, doing work. I was more into the energy drinks, but yeah, I haven't had one of those in a long time. Come to think of it, some of them are delicious. I remember the flavor of the uh, uh, the stuff. <laughs> some of them aren't as bad for you as they say. But we're not talking about energy drinks. We're talking about Mark. And can we start off with a compliment here? Uh, sure. <laughs> okay. So you're one of those people that's super under the radar to the average person, unless they're in a nerd like me who reads the liner notes. But I would say anybody who listens to the radio for six hours, you know, classic hits kind of radio, they've heard your work. You're so... How does that make you feel in general, knowing that everyone has heard your work, but they don't necessarily know, hey, that's Mark who did it? Is that an okay feeling? Do you like being kind of anonymous? Yeah, I, I've never ever thought about it that way. I mean, the the uh, the reason I got into this line of work wasn't to be wasn't to be famous. I mean, I'm not a performer. I don't have that kind of uh, mentality or talent. <laughs> debatable but, uh, right there because your ability to work with sometimes personalities who are known to be a little complex that's very talented oh or, yeah but i mean as a as a as an artist i mean i you know i i dabbled with the guitar at the age of 16 and you know never, never really pursued it or got any better or any worse um <laughs> but to an, but to answer your question no i mean i i didn't get into it i didn't get into it for that um i'm not sure that that anybody really gets into this line of work thinking that they're, you know, going to be famous or renowned. And obviously it's really only a matter of degrees. I mean, even the biggest, um, uh, you know, most well-known, you know, engineers bear, you know, are barely going to uh, uh, attract a uh, neophyte audience, you know, um, the, you're, you're known within your, within your industry. So, Right. Uh, that was never that, that was never the reason uh, to get into it or the reason to, uh, to do it. I mean, I got into it like, you know, the same as a, I was always a music fan and I got into it as one way of, uh, you know, being in this business. I, I could have I started out in lighting. I could have uh, I, I could have ended up, you know, there professionally just just as easily. Got it. Well, I started bugging you a year and change ago about interviewing you because I was writing a book about Dave Lee Roth that's finally coming out oh. in 2024. And your name is in the credits for Crazy from the Heat. I wound up speaking with Gary Reinfuss, who told me the story from his perspective of Crazy from the Heat. But one thing, one mystery I was trying to figure out is you're forever associated with the Beach Boys. And Dave kind of repopularized the Beach Boys with the cover of California Girls, which had Carl Wilson on it. Now, is it an absolute coincidence that you worked with Carl and Dave on that? Or did that- Yeah, it is, because it actually happened before, uh, uh, several years before my association, my, my deeper association, before I started working with Brian. And the reason it, I mean, I just to back up a little, I had worked with Carl once or twice before because i did a, i had done a bunch of albums with america and oh. carl and jerry beckley were, were friendly uh so carl and i want to say christopher cross and yeah. somebody else sang on a couple of their records and i engineered those sessions um uh, i specifically remember you know doing them at at, at uh, warner brothers amigo studios where i was a staff engineer at the time and so when um I, you know, I don't know who booked it, but uh, prob prob probably Ted Templeman booked it. Yes. At a uh, they booked the session to do California Girls. I got assigned to the session. And uh, that was my first. Yeah, that that would have been my first real beach, boy, you know, any, any sort of Beach Boy connection. Um, and it was, you know, it was just a day's worth of work. I do remember 
specifically Carl coming in with a cassette, you know, like Beach Boys Greatest Hits or something and saying, I, you know, we, we got to listen to this because we don't, uh, we, you know, we don't, we don't do it this way on stage anymore. Um, wow. That's, that's something I've never heard before. Now in, in speaking with Gary and then speaking with tons of people who work with Dave, Dave always portrayed this, like, I'm a slacker. I'm a California guy kind of vibe, but you realize that everything was really choreographed and organized and well thought out in that era. So Gary was telling me the crazy from the heat EP in that sessions, they weren't this secretive top secret organization. It was just like, yep, Dave is recording and that was it. And it was, everyone was well rehearsed and it wasn't these tense vibes, kind of like the media portrays it to be. Do you have that kind of recollection, re recollection or was it just- you know, frankly, I don't remember if Dave, if, if, I mean, I assume he was there, it didn't have to be, but I, I don't remember him being there. Although I do know that either that day or maybe a day or two after um, him, him coming into the studio and just doing a bunch of ad libs, I think on on uh, uh, all three girls. Um, but like I said, I mean, it was just you know, it was just two fairly quick sessions. Uh, and what would that be? Um, <laughs> close to forty years ago, yeah. Close to 40 years ago is correct. Almost 40 years. And we're still listening to that music. We're still talking about that music. And you could say the same about the Beach Boys. You know, you're working on things that happened 50 years ago in some cases. and Or, or more, yeah, or 60 years ago. <laughs> so in the case of you started off as a Brian Wilson guy, as far as I know, and then you became a Beach Boys approved person, which does not always happen. You don't always graduate to that kind of a process. The first time you worked on the Beach Boys, did you know that it was going to be a long-term thing? No, not at all. I mean, actually, it, you know, I, I wound up working with Brian in the in the oddest sort of way. Um, you know, literally a phone call, you know, uh, uh, caused it to happen. I called, um, this is what, 18, 1987, I guess, and I called Ocean Way Studios, which was uh, the rebranded um, United Western. And I, I must have been looking to book time or availability for some project that I was doing or that was coming up. And the uh, uh, the booker, the lady that, that ran the studio, said, oh, by the way, we, we've got a, uh, a last minute booking on this is like Monday on Thursday for Brian Wilson. And they need an engineer. Uh, you know, are you available? And I said, well, well, sure. I'd never met him, but, you know, fan stories, all the rest of it. And yeah. it when I realized later that this was because what, what, you know, this is when uh, uh, Eugene Landy was running the show and what he used to do is for whatever reason, you know, tell Brian to go in the studio as a kind of therapy. And so he'd tell his, you know, his, his minion, one of his minions to find a studio and um, you know, book it. And they didn't, you know, at that point, this was sort of the early days of Brian's first solo record, and they hadn't really, you know, they'd sort of gone different places and used different different people that worked at the studios, but they hadn't really uh, had anybody of their own. Um, so that's what happened. They, you know, they they found a, an open an open day in an open studio at uh, Ocean Way and didn't have an engineer. And so I did that. I did that session, and that turned into you know about a year working on. Uh, um, Brian, you know, Brian's for a solo record all, all over town. We bounced all over town, did this a lot. I mean, we mostly stayed in the same places, but I mean, we worked on the West Side a lot. We worked at Sunset. We worked at um, uh, Soundcastle, a whole bunch of, whole bunch of places. And of course, it was a lot of, you know, a lot of cooks. I mean, you had Landy sort of, you know, overseeing being the, uh, you know, rather odd puppet master but yeah. then you know you had you had russ andy paley and russ Tidelman, uh who i'd worked with a lot at warner brothers and lenny warnaker um who really only got involved musically in um, um rio grande which which i had a lot to do with mm -hmm. um but yeah so it was a very long drawn out uh project and then right about the same time uh you know this is early in the you know, a couple or a couple of years into the release of CDs, 
And uh, it was decided, you know, I'm going to put Pet Sounds on CD. So they gave me that job because I was working with Brian. And that, um, <clears throat> and that, um, that turned next into doing the, uh, the Capital Catalog and then the Good Vibrations box and uh, whatever it was, 90. And then the Pet Sounds box and, you know, on, on and on and on. Mostly it had to do with the fact that, you know, the, the, all those early albums were Brian's productions. So right. it, it could have gone a different way, but, um, you know, it kind of made sense to uh, connect it to Brian. And I think also, frankly, that, uh, well, I know, I know so that, uh, you know, with one more way that Landy was staking out his territory, um, uh, you know, that, that, he, that he was in charge of the, of the bigger picture and you had to deal with him, you know, um, it, which which actually made him, you know, kind of acting the way a manager um, of someone like Brian, um, uh, you know, should behave. You know, protect your protect your client, uh, your client's interests, even if it happens to be your own as well. I mean, I've always felt that that um, you know Brian's had a lot of people in his life that 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 uh, wound up doing uh, good things for him. For the wrong reasons. I mean, yeah. I never, I never knew his father, but you know, to to infer from what I've heard and see, uh, you know, read about, um, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't think he necessarily uh, got capital and Nick Vinay to let Brian produce on his own, um, because he was acting as the producer, and so Nick Vinay was kind of in Murray's way. Um, and it was, you know, but he did it, and it was extremely unusual uh, to have something like that. Uh, I can't really, well, I can't really think of anybody else in that in that in that time period that was that was, uh, you know, uh, producing their own records. No, not the Beatles. <laughs> Nobody at a top level was, and I, and this is a compliment in your direction. Uh, because I know interviewers are supposed to compliment and not be unbiased whatsoever. So I'm following that paper uh, trail. <laughs> I love how much the Beach Boys have kept and or they've found because it's the exact opposite of, say, Van Halen. Van Halen had just put out a box set or just announced a box set with Sammy Hagar where the whole rarities disc is stuff that was on multi-platinum selling releases, not mm -hmm. quite a rarity. And the Beach Boys, by comparison, the backstage rehearsals that we're getting, all the alternate mixes, et cetera. Is there a lot more to come from the Beach Boys? And I'm not looking for explicit exclusives of what's to come, but is there still a lot more to come for us fans? It's, yeah, it's two different, well, two different questions. The, I'd say there's less, um, you know, we're getting, we're getting into, I mean, 50 years out, we're getting into the period where they actually started to go back and look for things that they had left behind. Um, you know, girls get together and, and I just got my pay things like that, that, you know, got recycled or, you know, brought, you know, brought out later. So there's less, we, we have lots of live material. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how much of that's ever, you know, it's going to make sense uh, 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 to release. You know, part of the problem is that um, the more, let's say, unknown esoteric uh, material, even when it's really, you know, really important and, and, and really uh, revelatory, it's a fairly small market. And as I understand it, right. you know, from the powers that be, uh, <laughs> it's getting smaller. It, it it you know I mean and it's partly just the way everybody consumes music now. Um, you know it's it, you know sit down and listen to a record. It's streaming. Uh, you know you get playlists and this you know this uh, this especially things that I find fascinating. I mean taking taking a song taking a recording that, that we know and taking it apart and showing how it you know how how it was constructed and. You know what amazing, um, especially you know amazing vocalists they, they were. Um, that you know has much less interest in you know non-hardcore dedicated fans than the hits. Um, you, you know, so in some ways the the <laughs> in some ways the Beach Boys um, 
historically are uh, uh, pri you know prisoners of their own success because because from a marketing or record label point of view, uh, while it would be great you know if we could put out a new you know a new album um, of old material and have it really you know make a dent in the market um, that that isn't likely to occur. And of course, the you know the the well known stuff, the hits and and so on, um, you know they for 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 perfectly good obvious reasons they they just keep selling. I mean, the Feel Flows project is is really kind of interesting. I mean, that's getting into that era, the the uh, Sunflower um, uh, Surf Sub era and beyond. I mean, and then of course uh, Corona Passions and uh, Holland. I mean, that's something that I've been pushing for you know, for, for 20 plus years through God knows how many um, um, big wigs at, uh, at Capital and now Capital slash UMG, um, right. you know, both because it's great music, but also the notion that as, as back in the, in the day, um, the hope that it would expand the, the group's fan base. And then when we, the first indication that I was maybe right was when we, we did uh, 67's um, uh, Sunshine Tomorrow. And uh, it, it sold way, way better than anybody expected. They actually had to hold up the release for um, two or three weeks because the vinyl pre-orders were so much greater. Not a bad problem to have. <laughs> on the other hand, it did not instantly turn into, oh, Great, let's you know let's do sixteen more of these. And initially, uh, um, when we proposed, when Alan, uh, Alan Boyd and I uh, proposed the Feel Flows project, um, it got it got shot down at the corporate level in favor of you know like a vinyl you know box set of reissue vinyl because and I, I'm not, I mean I don't blame anybody. I mean this is you know this is a business and it's become. Yeah. It's sorry to rudely cut you off. It's record companies are not run by creative people; they're run by accountants and lawyers for the most. They part. used to, be, yeah, they used to be. Although I, I, I um, it's, it's been a long time, and of course, you know, back back when all of this stuff started. I mean, you know, uh, when we started doing these projects, I mean, the Good Vibrations box is something that, you know, probably would have happened from all for all kinds of reasons. But doing the Pet Sound Sessions box back there, back then. I don't even remember who, you know, how that how that got proposed or came about. And it's still the only uh, project that I know of that, you know, covers one album from, you know, from start to finish um, over whatever it is, four or five uh, 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 discs. Um, and it certainly wasn't, um, I mean, there may have been a little, little thought about, uh, um, sales but back you know but back then it wasn't this was catalog i mean you know the capital selling 20 million bob seeger records every year that you know so this is you know, this is what you you could you could you could have a um a reflection on your hit uh, on a label's history and 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 an artist catalog without it having to be financially um uh, guaranteed and viable. I mean, which is something that I, you know, on all levels, I appreciated having worked at Warner Records for several years, you know, where, uh, I mean, we did, you know, they and we you know, did all kinds of things just because, oh, I like this artist, you know. Uh, right. and I, you know, I worked, I did a whole lot of projects um, after I got associated with Andy Paley, you know, because he worked for Seymour Sign at Sire. And you know Seymour would you know would hear somebody or you know and, and sign them and uh, um, you know do give him a few records and you know mo most of what we did was not no, nobody ever broke through but I mean he was renowned for that um, yeah. you know yeah, I mean, without Seymour the world would not have Madonna the Talking Heads a lot of you know of course Madonna was more of an overnight success but other artists with the talking heads, you could see that it was going to take a long time to break this and make it legendary. So, yeah, and then not, not necessarily, I mean, you know, good selling, I mean, not, not Madonna selling. Right. Uh, I always heard the story that Madonna was, was one of the hardest things for him to sell to, uh, um, to the big wigs at Warner's. They just, you know, uh, you know, they, they didn't, they, they didn't see it. 
um, you know, but he did. And, uh, yeah. nothing else. They, they appreciated, you know, um, you know, his ability to, uh, to, to find, to find talent. So, you know, when we were doing those things, it, it was, um, th those earlier projects on the beach boys, um, it, it was a lot easier to, uh, uh, to sell them because the expectations weren't, you know, now everything literally has to be thought of in terms of some kind of guess as to what it will, what it will sell and, um, you know, versus what it's going to cost and what we're going to sell it right. for. And so, yeah, so field flows almost it literally didn't happen except that outside forces uh, with the band stepped in and, you know, kind of insisted literally yeah. because uh, you know, they, they thought the music was so good and so and and so important, um, and uh, you know, it it uh, it it fulfilled <laughs> its promise. Although I, I mean, I don't know, you know, what the sales figures are. I mean, you know, nowadays it's really hard to tell because so much of it's based on streaming and right. uh, so all you know, all the conventional uh, you know ways of looking at. Uh, everything from start to finish kind of get turned get turned on its head so that's a you know that's that's an additional problem maybe the biggest problem going forward is while um there's an awful lot of material that a lot, that a lot of people would like to hear and mm -hmm. um, uh, and and why um it's difficult to figure out within the structure of the business you know which is tightened uh, anyway yeah um, you know how 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 to make that worthwhile from a label's um, point of view how to I keep mean, the lights on with the revenue from that as well how to pay for the project managers who have well, the yeah they uh, got, only got a certain number of people and they're there and there are fewer of them all you know than there were you know 10 15 years ago so more work for fewer people and on some level you know uh, and probably more so than ever, I think, it's just my opinion, you know, a project's a project's a, pro a project. I mean, sure. you know, it, <laughs> the money on a, you know, on a corporate level, the money for, for any record is the same, you know, so whether it's 10,000 Beach Boy records or 10,000 Grand Funk Railroad records, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I mean, in the accounting department, uh, if they all get... <laughs> They, the royalty rates or the reversion stuff is funny. Well, <laughs> I get what you're saying. Do you, do you mind if I ask you one more question that I don't know if it's going to yield a 10 second answer or a five minute answer? Uh, sure, I am. Okay. Five minute, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, Mark, again, an, intrigue me. And we didn't talk about your work with Hall and Oates, all these classic arts. It's not just Beach Boys and David Lee Roth with you. No, I might, we might want to do that because, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm obviously. You know, it, it's well mostly known for the the work with the Beach Boys over the last. Oh my God, it's thirty. You know, it's it, it's approaching forty years. Um, but I, mean, I did an awful lot of other things. You know, in 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 in, in before and in and in between. Um, but but go, but go ahead. What were you? Uh, well, that's just kudos to you. In that, I'm saying when you go to a CBS or a supermarket or something, you're going to hear something that Mark worked on, whether or not you know it. But my last question to you is. You've created such an interesting niche for yourself in the music industry that a lot of producers, engineers, project coordinators are chasing hits. And in your case, you, <laughs> you're chasing catalog and quality right. titles, and you've been consistently doing that for decades now after you know paying your dues and working on the mainstream hits. I'm curious what your work schedule is usually like is your work schedule like a nine to five kind of situation or does oh, no, it never, never been. And, and you know i'm i'm uh, i'm, I'm semi-retired at this point um and not really not really i'm not really making records anymore i mean i still do the i still do the catalog stuff and related a lot there's a lot of you know there's still a lot of beach boy related right uh, and um you know my my um my other career business, whatever, you know, I was always in love with doing live recording and uh, uh, maybe because I started out as a, as a live mixer. Um, but, um, and I used to, <laughs> I used to drag, 
I, I had uh, this portable, you know, relatively speaking, uh, 16 track uh, deck that I used to drag around town and uh, sometimes just record for the heck of it. Um, can't say that I got, I, I wound up recording to, uh, well, hardly anybody that turned, you know, turned into somebody, uh, but it was still fun. And actually I've got a record coming out um, of a whole bunch of uh, uh, surf, surf band all-stars that I recorded for fun in uh, 1995 um, at the lighthouse here in Los Angeles. And it, you know, it's been something in my closet for 28 years. And uh, I don't know that I can't remember if I ever really made any attempt to get someone to release it, but uh, you know, uh, finally did uh, sort of at the tail end of the pandemic, which is another story. But um, and now it's yeah, it's finally going to going to come out sometime. Uh, I hope by the end of the year. Sort of waiting on artwork. Um, yep. But I but so I got I got into live work and then in in. Uh, and had my own systems, but then in 2009, um, partnered up uh, with a company back east and some and a guy here and uh, built this remote truck. And so I spent a good a good bit of the, you know, uh, uh, 10, 12, 13 years, um, you know, working on that business. And I, I, I don't I don't know that I really let the record the record side of things go so much as it just sort of went away as it as it all, always did for most people. Um, I tell the story that, you know, I, I, I remember 10 or 15 years ago talking to Bones Howe, who uh, they may be familiar. I mean, he was sort of the first, he really was sort of the first um, engineer, um, independent engineer. You know, back in the day in the 60s, engineers were associated with, with particular studios. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was that was a large part of the selling point of the studio was the engineer that was there. I mean, Bruce, you know, Bruce Botnick, for example, was was um, so, you know, worked at Sunset Sound. And, you know, that's how that's how he wound up doing the doors and love and, you know, a million other things and before he went independent. Um, but Bones um, was kind of the first the first guy that that became independent uh, uh, after working with the. Uh, uh, at Western and then working with, you know, on all the Lou Adler records and the Jan and Dean records. And then um, it became a producer, did the fifth dimension, Tom Waits, uh, the Elvis 68 comeback special. But I remember talking to him and uh, you know, these guys that were, you know, may not be that well, again, not, you know, not terribly well known to the, to the, to the general public, but certainly within the industry and right. just sort of wondering, you know, you know what what you know why he just sort of stopped whether it you know uh whether it was intentional and his answer was simply at some point the phone just stops ringing you know um and uh you know that so that you know that hap that happens to all of us and it's all it's all i he didn't say this but i feel it you know it's also true that at some point uh you just don't feel like being the bushes um you know uh, uh uh and and the way records are made you know have been made since i got into it it's also um it it gets harder to want to do that kind of work when you were asking about the time frame doesn't you know doesn't, doesn't happen now i mean you know the closest thing to a um to a dedicated time frame for me is i still i still do live work i work for uh, uh the for iHeartRadio at their uh, broadcast facility here in Los Angeles. And so, you know, we do maybe two or three shows a month. Um, you know, so that's like a, it's still, yeah, that's still pretty lightweight. Cause I mean, I, I, uh, we work there generally on site around uh, 10, 11 o'clock in the morning and we're usually out, out, you know, and it's a very, you know, we, we spend more time sitting around than we do actually doing anything. That's the good part of corporate music that the hours are regulated so you're no longer doing 18 hour sessions rico i don't know how I'm I mean, gonna... i've done 24 hour sessions yeah <laughs> i can imagine so it i'm so... not that young anymore so that you know that that's the closest thing uh for me these days is to do something like that i i you know i i still own the truck but you know i i won't go out and do those things because that it those do tend to be um very long days and the worst thing about those kind of kind of jobs is 
you know, you generally have to get in very early in the morning because you got to bring in the truck, you got to set up the truck, you got to pack, you know, you got it all, you know, and then do the sound check. And then you sit on your ass for four hours waiting for the friggin' show to start. And then you got to tear it down. I mean, you know, it was fun when I was in my 20s. Um, and, yeah. you know, I, I used to tour when I was in my uh, in my 20s. I, I uh, <laughs> it's really kind of a showbiz story, but when I, I literally on a Friday afternoon got, got a job mixing for Frank Zappa. Um, I didn't know that. Students. Warner well, Brothers. I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell you the story in a second, but, um, yeah. you know, you know, and, uh, well, let's tell, I'll tell the story and then I'll, then I'll buttonhole it with what I was going to say. Yeah. I mean, uh, um, you know, my short, uh, short thumbnail history, um, you know, I always wanted to, to, to be, you know, to be in this business. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is, this is back in the late sixties, early seventies, and there was no blueprint. I mean, it, you know, right. You didn't know if you didn't know somebody who knew um, or had done it, and uh, you know, or 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 you were smart enough to figure out. Oh, wait a minute! What I need to do is get you know, get in the room with people that are actually doing this. You know, I thought I'm like, wow, you know, these records. How, how do these get you know? Well, if I, if I can pause you for a second there, it's like the old adage of working in the mailroom just to get your foot in the door. That's right. how you got to know the people, but go on. I wasn't that smart enough. <laughs> and my family, yeah, you know, cause I've been, I've been doing this stuff, you know, uh, creatively since I was, you know, 10, 12 years old. Um, sure. Yeah. They thought it was a cute hobby, but right. they expected me to go to, you know, go to college and get, I mean, it would have been, Delightful if I'd wanted to be a uh, you know a doctor or a lawyer or something that they you know they could uh, get a relate. pension mark. <laughs> yeah, but um, uh, the, the, you know they thought what I did was a cute hobby and and even even though there was there, there was one person in my family that was sort of um, in, in showbiz he played in the uh, Boston Symphony Orchestra wow. nobody ever made any attempt to. Uh, you know, help me figure out <laughs> or, you know, or get on the inside. And, um, you know, so I did it all myself. First, I had a, I had a PA, I had my own PA company just out of high school in the, uh, around 1970. And we did a lot, you know, every, it, I even promoted a couple of shows at my high school, but every, you know, all the colleges and every, you know, we're all putting on concerts so we were doing, you know, Seals of Last Seals and Cross, Manhattan Transfer, Livingston Taylor, Shanana, people like that. Yeah. Uh, and and <laughs> for shockingly little money. Um, and, uh, but, you know, but it, it was sort of getting in the door, you know. Um, and I, I, I'll i skip the part where, where earlier on I, I had been fascinated and had my own light show company. So we used to do light shows and talk about a way not to make money. Um, <laughs> uh, but anyhow, so, um, you know, the, the sound company kind of imploded uh, around 1971. We, we, we got a big break to do a big show at the Capitol Theater in uh, uh, New Jersey. And we were not, not only were we not ready for it, we had the bad luck of I don't even know why they hired us because I can't remember who the band was, but you know it was it was clear about an hour in and maybe this is why we got fired that we couldn't we couldn't cut it so they basically said pack up and go home, and the, whoever the act was they had their own they really high tech um, PA in the truck I don't know so I don't know why they were hiring us in the first place well I guess because the, the the promoter was a was sort of a friend and probably trying to help us out but. So that was kind of that was that was that was the end of that business. We limped along for a little bit, and uh, I came out here um, with some friends and started knocking on doors, trying to you know trying to get trying to get into a studio. But again, I wasn't smart enough to know to think. Well, I'd be better off sweeping floors at the most happening place in town. I wanted, you know, I wanted to twiddle knobs and 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 you know punch record so i wound up working at at, at some really second rate places and um you know it really would have been next to impossible 
to have gone from there to anything successful. And I still didn't figure out that, okay, that might have been okay if in the meantime I was trying to get a job, you know, at, at a really good place, you know, where all the opportunity would be. So right. I gave up and went back back to New York and was living with, with my at my mom's house. And I got a job. <laughs> Funny how, how life works. I got a job uh, at a studio in New York owned by a guy named Ed Chalpin. You know who that is? I've he was, heard that uh, name. Was that a place in the in Midtown? Yeah, Midtown. Well, they, they, they had a couple of different studios over time, but um, Ed Chalpin was most famous for having signed Jimi Hendrix to a five dollar contract, and then uh, parlaying the sessions that he did uh, that Hendrix played on with Curtis Knight into you know <laughs> eighty million releases of you know get that feeling and all you know all this stuff. Um, and I worked there for for about four or five months. He was moving from one built one building to another, um, and I I never I didn't last long enough. And, you know, I was commuting. I mean, it was awful. So, <laughs> um, you know, my, like I said, my family was not supportive of my uh, you know creative aspirations, and <laughs> so I leveraged that into okay, you either you know get out and support yourself again or go back to college and I knuckled under and went to Boston University um as a uh um the heck was it called well anyway communications major that's right oh yeah and I, and I, 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 I believe uh, memory serves Howard Stern was actually uh not I mean not obviously in my class but but you know went through that that place as well right that's and, where you a little bit in the movie Private Parts that he went to BU and yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, but I, you know, so I'm I'm there and you know I, I did some little stuff at the, you know they have, they have a, a big radio station, but what well, by then it wasn't run by students. It had been in the early '60s, but when the counterculture came along and the students, I understand it, the students started using the radio station to promote you know anti-war and you know all the stuff that the trustees we're not too fond of uh, the students were out and they, and uh, you know, the pros were in. So there wasn't a whole lot I could do except that they didn't play rock, but they got all the rock records. So I was allowed to take, you know, a lot, a lot of uh, promo albums home. Um, sure. I a couple of, I did a couple of, you know, shows there for free, but it, it, it wasn't going to go in here, but so I'm in Boston and I'm, but I'm still knocking on doors. I mean, they, you know, there was very little, uh, very few studios, in Boston at the time. Um, I don't think I ever went there, but there was Synchron, which was owned by the Cars, um, and a couple of others. Fort Apache maybe was there. Uh, I know, I think that's later. Yeah, I can't remember. There was one, um, there, there were there were a few, but I, I mean, there was no work, you know. I did a few sessions on my own, but there was no work. Right. But, um, but I kept knocking on doors, and the, this this is kind of the point, you know. Of, of, of in those days, this was really the only way, uh, you know, you could get anywhere was to um, just want it bad enough that you'd keep doing it, even in you know, in the face of nothing. So um, I went out to Hanley Sound one day, which had which was, you know, they're they're in the audio business, but they're not in the recording business really. All well, they sort of were. Right. Um, you know, Hanley Sound had done the sound in Woodstock, and they equipped both the you know both the Fillmore Auditoriums. Uh, they you know they were the big they were the big sound outfit in, you know in those days, and they didn't have anything for me. Um, but I I I started uh, dating the receptionist, and um, who uh, coincidentally uh, had just moved back from California, where I don't know the time frame, but. She had been uh, uh, the girlfriend and nearly fifth wife, <laughs> apparently, of Howard Kalin from the mothers, you know, from, from the mothers. And the Avengers. turtles, and yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. And uh, so I, 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 you know, this is, I, know, I come home from photography class one Friday afternoon, and I get a phone call from her, and she says, "Look, um, <laughs> Frank Frank Zappa is opening." I didn't know anything about this. Frank Zappa is opening in, I think it was New Haven or Hartford, I can't remember which, tonight. 
Hanley Sound um, uh, provided, you know, starting a tour, provided the mixer for the tour. And the guy's deathly ill and you can't do it. So call, here's, here's the road manager's phone number, call him. So I call the road manager, his name was Marty Perellis. And, you know, he would have taken it, uh, you know, anybody that, that knew which way a microphone plugged in, I'm sure. <laughs> right. So she drives to the airport. I got, <laughs> get seen this now. I've got this little briefcase with like, a, you know, a toothbrush, a t-shirt, and a couple of pair of underwear. And I get on this prop plane and I fly down to uh, wherever, whichever it was, New Haven or Hartford. And I get to the, I get to the gig just as Mountain, the opening act, is finishing. I find the road manager, and he says, "Okay, go out, go out there to the front of house, you know." And I, and I and I mix front of house for other people for years, but when watch what this guy does. You're taking over after tonight. Well, that that was conservative. I go out there, and the show starts. I've seen Zappa once, by the way. I mean, I'm a huge fan, but I've seen him once on the previous tour when he played Boston, um, and. Um, uh, I don't know, you know, 15 minutes into the show, the the uh, the guy mixing, you know, runs off. He comes back once. He runs off again, never to be seen again. I, I to this day, I don't know, you know, I don't know what happened to it. Um, I, I probably, <laughs> I should dig out my old tour schedule, which of course was printed before I was hired. So it has his name there, see if I could find him. But anyway, so I finished mixing the show. And uh, you know, I'm thinking to myself, well, oh, you know, whatever they whatever they offer me, you know. <laughs> and um, uh, you know, show's over. I start packing. I pack, start packing up the gear. Road manager comes out and says, uh, "Okay, here's the deal. Uh, pay is four hundred dollars a week, uh, twenty five dollars a day per diem. You get caught using drugs, you're fired." That was you know, that was Frank, you know. Um, and the next morning, I find myself on the tour bus with. Frank, the entire band, including Captain Beefheart, this was the Bongo Fury tour, and the crew, and we're on our way to guess where? The Capitol Theater in New Jersey site. Yeah. I mean, I didn't really, I, I, I'm i sure it, it, you know, I, I, that dawned on me, but I was more concerned with, you know, the job at hand than the right. irony of, uh, you know, the added irony of that. And um, I was later to find out, you know, just, you know, why <laughs> why there had been a new mixer in the first place because Frank went through mixers all the time. So as a mixer, I only, I only lasted that one tour, but I wound up working for his organization and, and doing another tour with him. What, for, was that on Barking Pumpkin or what was the name of that? No, uh, it was called Intercontinental Absurdities. Frank, Frank was very, um, very forward thinking. I mean, he was, you know, he, he owned his own uh, sound and lights. And I'm not sure if at that point or just soon after, you know, had his own tour buses. So wow, I didn't realize that either. And his yeah. own studio and ultimately his masters and his publishing. How many people can well, now, you hear, now it's all been sold to UMG. But yeah, so so what happened was we finished um, we finished that tour and they booked uh, the sound and lights and his crew to go out with the electric light orchestra and do um, uh, uh, their their tour. So we did that. And then we came back and did another tour with Frank. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, but by that point he had hired somebody else to mix, but he liked my work ethic, I guess. And so, you know, I, I, I stayed on as sort of the PA, you know, PA Meister. And then after that second tour, the, the Frank went to Europe and we took the sound and lights, lights out in the U S again with ELO. And when they came back from that tour, I mean, <laughs> uh, Frank fired, let every, we fire everybody. He let everybody go. Yeah. And, uh, um, it's also, no, not quite then, but you know, he let everybody go. And so this is this is like 1976. And uh, the road manager and I went to, uh, uh, well, he went to work for Koala Ruffalo, uh, you know, who managed uh, at the time Earth, Wind and Fire. And I got hired to mix their next tour. Uh, long, long view, the uh, long view was that, that was good. Short view was it was horrible. It was a, I mean, I, they were nice people, but it was a terrible, 
terrible and grueling tour almost probably almost killed me um yeah. but you know so i'm getting ready to go out on this tour and i got a call from frank because he was you know putting a new band together and was going to go out on tour and i you know I, I couldn't do it, um, which was which was a shame. He was, you know, I'll just say for anybody who cares, I mean, he really was a great guy. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, you know, he wanted he wanted and expected, you know, what he wanted. Um, uh, I mean, the crew had less, you know, you know, I mean, we weren't musicians, so you know, he let he would let you know get rid of musicians because he wanted you know a different palette. Uh, not so much because they didn't like somebody or they didn't like how they played, although I'm sure that Or he happened. caught them with drugs. <laughs> no, the, see, the funny thing is that, that was more of a the way he wanted it, you know, because, uh, you know, he thought that, you know, you're working for him and, yeah. uh, you know, that's going to diminish your ability. But it wasn't it wasn't really dictatorial. I remember on the second tour, one of the um, one of the roadies got busted in Canada uh you know, for pot or something. And so he first, he disappears, you know, he's not there for two days and then he comes back and he hasn't been fired. And, um, you know, and then he has to leave again in the middle of the tour for his arraignment. And he didn't get fired. I mean, you know, from, say, Frank, Frank, uh, I'm, I don't know. So it obviously wasn't, and it never had been apparently. I mean, I, I, uh, what? No, I don't have it. A friend of mine on the on the tour, uh, 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 the late Paul Hoff, who's who's the guy pictured on the cover of uh, Overnight Sensation, the roadie oh. in, the, in the picture. Lovely man. Um, he showed me a note that he had framed that that Frank had sent to everybody during the Flo and Eddie, you know, the, the Volman Kalen uh, tours, saying, uh, you know, no more drug drug use on the tour, or, or you're all fired. And the road manager went, went to Frank and said, Frank, if you enforce that, it'll be you and Ruth Underwood on the stage tomorrow night. So it was, you know, it was more of a, you know, don't get out of control when, uh, you know, than a strict, uh, you know, e evangelical um, kind of, I never I mean, I, I never, I don't think I ever really had. Uh, you know any any real deep conversations with Frank, but but he was a great guy to work for and very egalitarian. I mean, if there was a club to go to, let's all go to the club. And everybody works for me, you know. Just go to the club. I mean, and he and I remember he hosted several um, several dinners for everybody. Um, very fancy restaurant in, in Chicago. He took us all to, and on the second tour, we were um, we were out, and it was you know Thanksgiving. We were going to be, you know, out out of town on Thanksgiving, so he booked, you know, he booked a, a restaurant for that. I mean, he was, he, you know, he was a real. He's a, he's a nice guy. At your uh, office, it sounds like he's one of those people that you he didn't want the good need good deeds that he did known, kind of like Prince. Uh, well, no, Brian, I I met Prince a few times, and he he, I, I don't know, I never really knew him, but I met him a few times, and he was very odd. Uh, I Very what... odd, but then out of nowhere, a gift would come, and he, you'd say thank you, and he goes, "No, nope, I didn't do yeah. that." Well, they that. Well, yeah, I, 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 you know, I don't, I don't have any experience. But you know, there is this whole thing, and, and it seemed less this way with Frank than other people that I wound up working for that you know I knew of as as a fan. Um, Frank just seemed to be who he was. Um, other people I worked for, I mean, I remember when I worked for Wind and Fire. Everybody was, you know, perfectly nice, especially Maurice White. Um, but you, 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 you got the feeling that you were dealing, you know, this is his persona to deal with the people professionally that he works with. And, it, and I told us, one night, for some reason, I got to ride back to the hotel in the limo with him. And, you know, he turned to me and we had this conversation about what I did. And, you know, I mean, it was really, you know, it was really person to person. So that was kind of unusual um but um what i was leading to about all that was what happened was <laughs> sure. um because of my working for earth wind and fire i met george bassenberg who was their engineer at the time did all their big records and so george sort of became um for a brief time a mentor and i wound up um second engineering for him on a bunch of sessions um at oh, not only, but it's such that sound. I remember the first thing I, I was there for was um, uh, Best of My Love by the Emotions. 
a big hit. And George was instrumental in getting me a job because at that point in time, this is 1977, Sunset was adding another studio. And in those days, you had two assistant engineers for each studio because you would often, more than likely, have back-to-back -back sessions. So you'd have a day right. session and a night session. So I got hired as one of the two guys um, for the new studio. So I finally, <laughs> at the age of 20, 526 you know got in the door someplace where if nothing else at least the, the the you know the people working there were first rate first chair um and it's you know it it it's uh i don't know which is more important probably the opportunity you know it's more you can be the talentless guy in the world in those days if you didn't if you didn't get a lucky break um <clears throat> you know you might never get anywhere but yeah so right. working there and i only worked there for a couple of years because in those days it had changed they didn't want their staff people um becoming um uh, uh you know, well-known in-demand engineers. They were, the, the business was attracting the, you know, there were, now there was a slew of independent engineers and producers um, and that's what the business was geared towards. So they actually, after, I mean, I started doing a lot of engineering um, for various clients in lieu of them bringing in the the, the big famous guys. And somehow this, <laughs> this, this chafed. So, uh, you know, they suggested, that I go independent after about a year and a half, two years. Um, this is, of course, then this is also the days where you were actually on the payroll. And, you know, if you lasted long enough, you'd get benefits. Of course, nobody really ever did last long. Right. Another, another, another reason to get rid of people. Right. Um, but, um, and, and so I went independent and didn't, you know, wasn't making a terribly good go of it. Uh, and we'll skip, I actually we've skipped a lot because I want, I, I, the end of my um, whoops, my touring career. Uh, I was working for Journey before they made it. Just as Steve Perry entered the group, and they were they were really nice guys. And I was on salary. I mean, you know, and I was promised a piece of the action. And I guess I would have gotten it. I don't know. But I just I, I'd had enough of touring. I mean, I, I just been you know, the flame had gone out. And frankly, I didn't like their you know. There were people that I probably would have stuck it out for, like Frank. You know. But I didn't like their music enough to, to, to keep the Greg Rowley era. I get it. They didn't yeah, yeah. And then I quit. I quit right band. before they right before they went out to promote Infinity, you know, their big breakthrough record. And they and I heard that later that they did 180 shows in six months. Wow. And I only well, I mean, it would have been pretty cush. I mean, all at that point, I only would have had to walk in and mix. I wasn't, you know, in the old days, I used to have to hump the PA and mix, you know. Well, but it still would have been. Uh, anyway, so, so I, you know, I, I got asked to, you know, go independent at Sunset, but I had met someone, mm -hmm. uh, 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 um, a contractor, who, for some reason, you know, thought to tell me that Amigo Studios, Warner, Warner Records Studio, which I was not familiar with, was looking for a staff engineer. Mm -hmm. Lost somebody. So I went out there and got hired. And... You know, I mean, that's how I wound up doing, you know, a lot of Randy Newman projects and, and Los Lobos' first record and, uh, you know, um, and, and and California Girls with David Lee Roth. And if that wasn't enough, that's where I met my wife. And we've been married for uh, almost 40 years. So, um, you know, you can, you know, the, 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 the succession of events, um you know, a couple of just you know one thing. You know that that dating that dating that uh, uh, that person, the receptionist who told you about the Zappa gig, Zappa thing, which led to the Earth Wind and Fire thing, which yeah. led to George Massenburg and Sunset Sound, and then you know to Amigo, which you know, and, and, then, and then also to cut you off, the Eugene Landy random circumstance call about the engineer needed on the one day, that turning into decades of Beach Boys related work. Oh, decades of Beach Boys and, and, and a million other things, because, you know, I, uh, yeah, but, I mean, at that point, it could have gone all kinds of ways, you know, but. Um, um, uh, 
but as but also as you said you know the talent has to meet the opportunity for the success so it's a mix of bumping into genius as far as scum style and then also paying your dues and being competent and having the early failure with that first gig at the Capitol theater so i think it's it's a mix of wonderful things that give you a story like nobody else credits well, I, like I mean i think everybody has a sim- probably has a similar similar story. my 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 real point is that if i hadn't wanted you know we've just been like oh, well you know i could do something else here but you know i if, 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 i mean the circumstance yes i mean the fact that that i wound up uh having a, a relationship with the, you know the 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 receptionist at Hanley Sound who thought to call me when they needed somebody. Um, but I, I didn't go out there to get a date. I went out, you know, I, be, I was, I was desperately trying not to be a college student, you know, and, <laughs> and, and be in the business. And if I hadn't, I mean, all those things, you know, if, if I hadn't, if I hadn't done all those things because I was, you know, because I, I wanted it, uh, to, to get in, into the business so bad. Um, it it wouldn't um, it it wouldn't have happened, you know, um, and I mean, yeah, you know, and I did I, the things I did when I owned my PA company. I mean, just to be a part of it. I mean, you know, driving literally all you know from <laughs> the craziest thing we ever did with the PA company. I mean, because we were really threadbare. I mean, we didn't even own our own truck. So I remember. Um, getting up, go, going and renting a U-Haul, coming back, loading up the you know the U-Haul with the PA gear, driving to Washington D.C. and probably the same day doing a show, maybe laying over. I don't remember driving. Um, oh, anyway, and we wound up in Charleston, South Carolina, doing a show with Manhattan Transfer, and. Um, <laughs> Okay, so pack you know, pack up the pack up the uh, the van, and um, Gene Pastilli, the guy who wrote Sunday will never be the same for Spanky in our game, sadly deceased, gave us a joint. Well, we knew enough not to smoke it then, so we get in the truck and we drive straight back to New York with the help of Dexedrine, huh. and um, <laughs> well, this all seemed like fun dexedrine coffee so we get about we get about five miles from a home base you know a day or two later whatever it is and we decide we'll smoke the joint <laughs> and we i mean everything went so technicolor that you know I, I remember thinking we're gonna you know we're gonna wrap the truck around a, a a telephone pole five minutes from home you know but we made it i mean i and i relate that only i mean it was just like you know anything to uh um to, to sort of be a part of this, you know, of this industry. I can't imagine, you know, feeling that way now, um, but it's changed, you know, it, it, it's just, it, it's just changed so much out there. Um, but, but, but I think everybody, you know, everybody from, from, uh, from that date and time, you know, has got some kind of story. Although I, I do know that, that other people, you know, my, my age or generation in this business, we're a little smarter about where they where they should get their entry level job, um, um, you know, not <laughs> not just work anywhere. They let them let them let them do quote unquote real work, but to you know to work work somewhere uh, you know where the opportunity um, when the star broke their leg or you know which is kind of what happened to me, you know. Um, uh, you know, you'd you'd be the guy you you'd be the guy they turn to. Um, took me, you know, took <laughs> took me a long time to figure that out, and I and I always say I just made it under the wire because I was um, what was I? I was twenty, I was twenty five, twenty six when I got the job at Sunset Sound, and yeah. that's just you know that's almost too old, you know. <laughs> I was uh, um. I got hired at Warner's in 1980 when I was when I was 20, 28. But that you know, that that was okay because they wanted they they wanted an engineer. They weren't hiring us. They weren't hiring me as a second engineer. They had those. My right. wife was. 
um, they wanted, you know, the 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 they, they wanted to take the, someone to take the load off for the for the sessions, which was, you know, um, still fairly unusual um, at that point in time, you know. But but because it was a record company studio and they would put projects in there uh, of their own, it, it was kind of a different thing. Uh, and the big thing I, I did there was that you know, I worked on. Uh, for a long time on Ricky Lee Jones' second album, and then did uh, oh boy, what three or four more records with her, uh, both both in and out of that of that studio. Yeah, I, hey, the credits just keep getting better and better and better. But I just have to thank you for your contributions to the industry, to us music diehards of what we're listening to and still listening to decades later. So it's one of those things where it may have been painful for you at times, but we reap all the benefits as the fans, you know, Mark? Well, I mean, I would say it was painful. It was, you know, there was a long period where you... The you early 20s. You, you got to make a living, you know, and, and uh, yeah. you know, when I first moved out here, I was sharing. Well, I was sharing an apartment with a with a friend. It was a hundred, you know, a one bedroom apartment. So you know, uh, one of us had the bedroom. One of us slept in the. It was like a den or something, you know. And it was one hundred thirty five bucks a month, and and uh, it, it was wasn't easy to make the rent, you know, because uh, I was the only only one with any, you know, kind of kind of a job. If I, and if I and if I cleared if I cleared three hundred bucks a month, that was. Uh, you know that that was a good month. Um, of course, you could you could survive on that in nineteen seventy two.